Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome, Monsignor. Uh, thank you, Teresa. We're on show number 48. We're moving right along. We okay. are. We'll be very Good. quickly recording show number 50 and... I, it's just hard to believe. I know. I don't know how many we have now because I think we've stretched some of these out longer than originally you, you had the count for, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, yeah. I'm I'm very glad that we have lots more yet to come. Oh yeah, yeah. We got a lot to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Well, yeah. last week we looked at the Chicago. birth of Kansas City in Chicago yeah. from St. Louis and heading into that area. Yeah. Well, kind of. I guess Chicago wasn't really birthed from people from St. Louis, right, but we no. sent priests there. Right. And the, the priest that was uh, sent, this was at the request of Bishop Flaget, who was not able to provide clergy. Bishop Rosati sent a Father Sincere, who had just arrived in, in America shortly before, finished his theological studies at St. Mary's of the Barons, learned English, was ordained, and then his first, his first assignment was right up there in, um, in Chicago. In the little town of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, about 300 people. It was, okay. It was very, oh, wow. Well. No, at the most, and, and the people there were very generous. Catholics as well, and, and, and Protestants also. It took a month to get them to, to Chicago. <laughs> when the trunks arrived and he took up residence, they contained all the things that would be necessary then for saying Mass. And so he began saying Mass on a regular basis. Uh, unlike Father Rue, who had something against saying Mass or something, the people out in Kansas City. But, well, that's another story. <laughs> uh, he also said about baptizing and right. raising money for a church and encouraging particularly Indians. Wonderful. He mentioned that in a letter to Bishop Rosati, we're very blessed because Rosati kept all those letters. That is a blessing uh, yeah. without, without equal, really, because yes. if we didn't have all that... And, and, but the other thing about this was that they were all placed into tin boxes, and they were kept in a rectory in a closet, and it was in the late 19th century that a new pastor was assigned and was going through his rectory cleaning stuff out when he came across all of these. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating archival story about the, the letters of Rosati, but we have a lot of insight because he kept uh, copies of his letters and the letters that he received. And so we're very fortunate in that. And in this one letter that uh, Father Sincere writes, he said, when I go to dine with the Indians, this would be with the Potawatomi, he said that they sit at meal for almost five minutes in prayer, in wow. invocation, before they actually be a deed. And he was quite, quite impressed with them. It's here also that Father Sincere witnessed the historic treaty that was signed that would change the region forever. And this is in September of 1833, the Potawatomi Indians entered into a treaty with the United States government, and it was a huge land switch. They were going to sell the whole of their lands in Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan for $1 an acre, and they would be granted 5 million acres on the Missouri River out around what are now Council Bluffs. So it's a huge move west of an entire nation of peoples. The federal government wanted this land specifically for its veterans from the War of 1812. One of the things that it promised, if you served in the War of 1812, you, and as a veteran, you would receive land, but there was not a lot of land in the East. And so this is what the way they were going to do this was to basically populate Indiana and Illinois and, and parts of Michigan with white settlers of the veterans. And in order to do this, they made this deal with the Potawatomi. Not all the Potawatomi went along with this, as mm, we'll see a little imagine. bit later on. This is a, a very traumatizing thing. These people have been on these, this, these lands for a couple hundred years. Now, uh, we can trace the Potawatomi to other parts. Mm -hmm. They're part of the Algonquin peoples of the Great Lakes. But they've been living in this area now as long as they can remember. And now all of a sudden they're going to be uh, moving out. And for the leadership of the Potawatomi, they were doing this out of an act of desperation. They just knew 
that they could not stop the white the influx. Okay. It just was not going to happen in, into what is now, at that time, was known as the Northwest Ordinance. And they knew that they couldn't. And so the best thing that they could do then was make some sort of a, a deal in order to move further west. And so hopefully... They sold, again, Illinois, Michigan... And, and uh, Indiana. Now, and not all were, of the states. I mean, Right, but the area they land that yeah. they own. And then were moved over to count what is now Council Bluffs, Iowa. That's right, yeah. Which, yeah, which is Pottawatomie County, actually. Uh, there you go. <laughs> and see, there's a history behind all this stuff. <laughs> and, of course, 5 million acres. Pretty good you know, chunk mm-hmm. of land. This is all part of a pattern of land transfers that actually goes back to 1804, in which there had been a treaty between the Indian Territory Governor, William Henry Harrison. You've probably heard of him before. Turned out to be one of <laughs> our presidents. Have, right? Yep. <laughs> and he had signed this treaty in 1804 with five Sauk chiefs. Uh-huh. Okay. What happened was that there had been a confrontation between a group of Sauk warriors and some whites uh, north of St. Louis. And uh, the Sauk warriors murdered these men. And so the chiefs sued for peace and uh, because they knew this was not going to be good news. And they turned over the criminals uh, to the American government. And then Harrison went further. And unfortunately, it's one of these deals where he, first of all, gave them lots of gifts, these, these five chiefs, and then said, oh, let's celebrate. And they pulled out the alcohol. And th- these are, this is a long tradition of what's called alcohol treaties in which, you know, the whites have a couple of schnapps and they give some, or not schnapps, of course, yeah. rum or, or, or whiskey or whatever. And then uh, they know that Native Americans, the metabolism is not there mm-hmm. to be able to process it. And so they get drunk and they end up signing anything. And this is what they ended up doing. The Sauk Indian, tr- these five chiefs, turned over all Sauk land in Illinois, Missouri, and Wisconsin for $2,000 plus an annual stipend of $1,000. a terrible, terrible thing. And, you know, you've got to blame Harrison for doing this, those five Salk tribe, uh, tribal leaders for doing this also. And, of course, it's the Salk people who are going to, to suffer from, from the loss of their lands over such a ridiculous thing. The other tribes were not mm-hmm. so agreeable to leaving their ancestral land. And you had particularly the, the Kickapoo, many of whom were Catholic, and the Winnebago, who resisted this. And particularly when the United States government stepped in, uh, one of the things the Winnebagos were doing was in our, on their own land, they were mining lead. Oh, were they? Lots of lead mines, wow. yeah. And so they were uh, mining lead on their own lands, and the federal government uh, stopped them and said, you cannot do this. You don't own the mineral rights to your land. Oh, really? But when we own it, we do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, That's tempers terrible. rose, and some of the Winnebago warriors kind of went on a war path. And very unfortunately, there was a family of maple farmers. These are whites uh, who were out simply uh, had maple trees. They were you know, getting tapping, or... tapping, yeah. And they were slaughtered without provocation. This is around Prairie du Chien that that took place. Later, uh, a farmer and a hired hand were, were out in the fields, and again, uh, Winnebago warriors came along and slaughtered them too. In June of 1827, there was an incident on the Mississippi River in which two keel boats had been coming up the Mississippi, and they stopped in a Winnebago village. They didn't know about any of this other stuff going on. And the warriors came out to meet the keel boatmen. It was, seemed to be friendly enough. They shared food with each other. The keel boatsmen brought rum on, on shore, and they began drinking until both parties were pretty drunk, drunk. And in the middle of the night, the rivermen, they could, they could um, take the alcohol mm-hmm. better. They sobered up enough. There they are in this Winnebago village. They sobered up enough to kidnap a bunch of Winnebago women, and they took them on board of their their ships, and they raped them. And then they took off with the women on these boats. And 
the next morning when the Winnebago Warriors got up and with their hangover and they realized what had happened and, and they understood the insult, they took out after the boatsmen trying to get their women back. There was a confrontation between the two in which I guess both of them had had, both groups had had too much to drink and they, neither of them were particularly effective in fighting each other, but it gave an opportunity for the women to escape and make their way back to the village. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I, I know, what can you say? I, this is the West. Yes, right. <laughs> so tensions are just growing between the Winnebagos and the white population that's in that area until finally things just sprung over mm -hmm. when one of the chiefs, this is uh, Redbird, went ahead and organized his warriors and there was a pitched battle between him and white militia. Mm -hmm. And as the battle was forming up, this is an incredible moment. Chief White Bird realized that there would be people killed on both sides, and he went in front of his people and walked to the American side and gave himself up if they would not battle with each other. Wow. An incredible act of courage on his part to save his people. That's a real leader right there. Yeah. Well, not all of the warriors are going to respond that, that way. There is one salk chief who repudiated the five drunks mm -hmm. who had given away all that mm -hmm. land and his name was Black Hawk mm -hmm. and you, you know the name I recognize that name yes it's, mm -hmm. it's not just a hockey team okay. <laughs> <Right>. no. <laughs> he said this he said my reason teaches me that land cannot be sold the great spirit gave it to his children to live on, upon so long as they occupy and cultivate it they have a right to the soil. Nothing can be sold that such things can be carried away. Okay, so you can only buy things that can be carried away. You can't carry away land. Therefore, it belongs to the people who occupy it. So that, based upon that, he then began finding other Sauk warriors and other nations also that would support him in opposing this these land grabs that are happening. Of course... The Salk had been allies to the British in various wars, and even as late as the War of 1812, mm -hmm. uh, they had been famous for allying with the Canadians and fighting on the Canadian side, too. And there's one group in particular. It's simply known as the British Band. Okay. Okay. And it's about 600 warriors who had been fighting on the British side, and so they joined uh, Black Hawk. And his whole idea is to defend Indian lands, especially around the ancestral grounds, which is around Rock Island, Illinois. Well, this was seen to be a uh, provocation, and so the federal government put together an army under General Henry Atkinson. He arrived and was supplemented by state militias. And then he begins to attack. And when he did, Black Hawk withdrew his warriors into Winnebago territory, expecting the Winnebagos to come and join him. Well, it turns out that they want nothing to do with this. <laughs> they were not going to fight. Okay. And so as a result, Black Hawk withdrew further into, this time into Potawatomi land, okay. hoping that they would fight on his side. The Potawatomi would have nothing to do with it either. And so he realized that he was, he was not going to have this great war against the Americans. And so he sent a truce party out to the Americans. And as they were approaching the American lines, the federal troops fired on them. Oh. And so uh, it was obvious that, uh, that uh, Black Hawk was not going to be able to sue for peace, not be able to come up with some kind of a, uh, a, a truce or a treaty. And so, ultimately, in desperation, he led a, an attack of some 48 warriors against an American militia. Uh, this was under Isaac Stillman. To show how desperate these warriors were, there are 40 warriors. They attacked 275 militia. The attack came as such a surprise that the militia broke rank. <laughs> they threw away their weapons, and they ran 25 miles all the way to the safety of a camp. I mean, that's better than a marathon. <laughs> wow. And they didn't have tennis shoes. So it's known as the Battle of Stillman's Run. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately for Black Hawk, it also gave a certain bravado mm -hmm. that he thought that, oh, yeah, you know. We can handle these guys. We can handle these guys. Yeah, no big deal. Uh, until the regulars uh, arrived with some 1,300 
troops, regular troops, and along with this, a, a steamboat that was equipped with cannon and snipers. It's known as the Warrior, and it was on the Mississippi River. Black Hawk, this is in, in August of 1832. On August 3rd, he decided the best thing he could do was to take all of his followers, cross the Mississippi into Iowa, and hopefully get away from these Americans. And that's what he was in the process of doing when the Americans arrived. And they arrived, of course, on the east side of the Mississippi. His warriors, the women, the children, cattle, they're all swimming the Mississippi to get across. And as they were in the process of doing that, the Americans lined up on the side of the river and began sniping, shooting at these people trying to flee. And the warrior, the steamship, arrives right at that same time, and snipers up on top are shooting down, killing these people. And as they're trying to get out of the river to run on into the Iowa land, they're being sniped at the at the riverfront. And then those who got further in are being hit with artillery shells oh, from wow. the cannon. Something like 300 Indians were killed in that first day, that one day. Wow. The Black Hawk War was over with this. And Black Hawk himself... Um, <laughs> surrendered to um, to the Americans in order to end this war. He was taken as a prisoner and then mm-hmm. sent from prison to prison by President Jackson as some sort of a war prize, showing off the fact that he had, you know, that Jackson had won he and all that. Him. There is no great love between Jackson and American Indians. So you can tell that. Black Hawk himself died in 1838, which is also the year of the Trail of Tears, when the U.S. government removed all the peaceful nations of the southeast, the five civilized tribes, as they were forced out west, particularly to the Indian territories, or what is now Oklahoma. Father Sincere writes a letter to Bishop Rosati in anguish over the removal of the Potawatomi from their lands also. You know, it, it turns out that there had been no provisions had been made to the support of their Catholic faith. Uh, there was no chaplain going to be with them. There was nothing by way of support. The land that was given by the Potawatomi to Father St. Cyr, mm-hmm. they said, if you come, you know, we've got five million acres. If you come, we'll give you land, we'll build you a church. We'll, you know, He was seriously thinking about that. The federal government seized that land and refused to allow him to build a church out there. So he was left to ca- take care of the sacramental needs of the Chicago Catholics who remained mm-hmm. and of course without the Potawatomi and it's only later that the Potawatomi now out in the Council Bluffs area are going to reacquire their faith and that's going to be through the Jesuits who are going to send a Jesuit out to Council Bluffs and then later there's another removal that takes place the Potawatomi still refer to this as the Trail of Death and we'll talk about that a little bit later on with mm-hmm. Father Pettit and these were people who are sent out to an area south of Sugar Creek and uh, left to die. And they made their way up to Sugar Creek where there's a, a Jesuit mission there and they were able to survive. This is the group to which uh, St. Rose Philippine de Chen eventually will go. Okay, as well I knew as she went to the Potawatomi. Yeah. Okay. But boy, I mean, what a what a sad you know, a tale that is, is in tale. It's with. horrible. Yeah. So... In 1838, that's when Blackhawk died in prison. Right. And that's the beginning of the Trail of Tears. It's the same year as the Trail the of Tears. Wow. Now, the other trails that the Potawatomi and all had done had been, been earlier than that. Yeah. One of the side effects of the Blackhawk Wars was the beginning of a cholera epidemic, which we'll talk about later on, the terrible cholera ep- epidemic of 1832, mm-hmm. which visits St. Louis as mm-hmm. a direct link to the Blackhawk Wars. Well, while... Rosati is involved in, in all of this. He's also becoming more and more occupied with large numbers of Germans and German Catholics who are coming to Missouri, especially central Missouri. A lot of this is the result of a man named Gottfried Duden, who had written a book that was widely circulated in, throughout Germany. You remember but we, mm-hmm. that we talked about him, that he had, mm-hmm. he had settled in Dutzau, Missouri, mm-hmm. thriving farming community, and so more people come over. In October of 1833, there's a whole group that comes from the region of Osnabrück in Germany. They settle in and around Washington, Missouri, on the Missouri River. 
Now, they're going to settle on the south of the Missouri River rather than the north where Dutzau is. At the beginning, the first wave coming in was 12 families. And they make their way, first of all, from Osnabrück to Bremen. They take a ship from Bremen to New Orleans, a steamboat from New Orleans to St. Louis. Their original notion was to settle on the Illinois River. Mm -hmm. But the day before the steamboat was going to take them to the Illinois, it sank. <laughs> and so they decided to go in the other direction. It was to go the other way. <laughs> so, yeah, some, 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 somebody told them about this place called Marthasville and uh, the possibilities of vineyards. And so they <laughs> headed out west instead. And, of course, they learned about it from Duden's book. Uh -huh. So there they are. And when they arrive, these are 12 families, you know, arriving in this little tiny village. They're given hospitality by a man named Mr. Owens. That's all we know about him. But he <laughs> went ahead and let them use his warehouse and gave them whatever they, they needed to get started. And as winter was setting in, these Germans proved their industriousness, and they built several wooden houses for themselves. They hired themselves out to local farmers who appreciated their work ethic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And shortly after, more Germans started arriving. And these were people from Westphalia, and they were therefore Catholic. So the, the Germans in Washington, Missouri, were very Catholic, and they wished for a priest. And they asked for a priest, but there was no priest to be sent to them. And so for two years, they had to do with the prayers that were led by the sacristan of their number. His name was Henry Niemann. And later on, Father Helias, who we'll talk about later on, uh, arrived. He's actually a Belgian, and he arrived in the German town of Westphalia, which is you know, central Missouri. Uh, when he arrived in Westphalia, there was another priest, Father Henry Meichmann, who then came to join them. Now, this Father Henry Meichmann is from Germany? He came with them? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, Father Meichmann uh, accompanied a group of, of German immigrants who founded Westphalia, Missouri. Okay. It's a very interesting group of people because these were not farmers. These were PhDs. <laughs> these were a group of intellectuals, philosophers, and professors from German universities who had decided that life in the civilization was too corrupt and they wanted to return to the soil and live simple lives. And so they migrated to Westphalia, Missouri, and they started farming. They had no idea what they were doing. And uh, actually, they're nicknamed Latin farmers. Okay, you know, because they were educated. Educated, yeah. Now, unfortunately for Father uh, Munkman, he arrives in St. Louis without faculties. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was because the credentials had not been sent from his home diocese okay. of Münster. And so his, his vicar general had simply failed to do that. And so Father Meinkmann is not authorized to act as to a priest. Mass. Yeah, un until, and so he's kind of cooling his heels, and Bishop Rosati's waiting for something from, you know, the diocese. <laughs> anxiously of waiting that. <laughs> yeah, anxiously, yeah. And eventually when the papers arrived, he's immediately sent out to Westphalia, <laughs> where he's then made the pastor which made Father Helias very happy because Father Helias did not like these Latin farmers. <laughs> he, he, well, a little later on, we'll talk about a conflict that, that he had with, with some of them. They couldn't get along with anybody. And, and Father Meinkmann himself, they started complaining about the, these Latin farmers. Did. Or complaining about the priest that was about with them? About the priest that was sent yeah, to okay. them. Because while he was not able to act as a priest, he acted as a teacher. Uh -huh. uh, f uh, for their children, and it turned out that th this big struggle broke out in this little town of Westphalia between the Westphalians uh -huh. and the Rhinelanders. Uh, okay. Okay. These are people from the same part, part of, of Germany, <laughs> really, but you know they're, they're enough that their dialect is slightly different. And mm -hmm. so, anyway, the long and short of it is, they succeeded in getting uh, Father Meichmann uh, transferred to Washington, <laughs> Missouri. Wow. Where he was more than happy to be. To get away from <laughs> Get away from these guys. <laughs> and uh, the people there built a, a little small uh, log cabin for him. 
and things continued on until 1839 when finally he was called back home by his heart. Father Meichmann. Yeah, Mike Mike Mike. Yeah, okay. the Germans have a term for it. It's Heimweh. Uh, it's, it's a longing to go home. home. And so he returned back. And when he did... Which is what Duden did too, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, a lot of them did. And uh-huh. actually about a quarter of all Germans who came to America went back home. Is that right? Yeah, Germans and Scandinavians. Anyway, he was replaced by the Jesuits who arrived and they changed the uh, patronal saint of the parish from St. Francis Regis to St. Francis Borgia. Really? And both of them were Jesuit saints. But St. Francis Borgia is the parish there today. Yes, it is. It serves uh, the Catholics of, of Washington, Missouri. But it had been St. Francis Regis. Yeah. Well, towns sprung up all along this area. A lot of them were Germans who were coming with uh, obvious connections. In North St. Louis, a lot of people from Baden came, oh, mm-hmm. and they formed Baden. Mm-hmm. Others came around the new capital of Jefferson City, Hartsburg. Let me just name some of these towns sure, that yeah. we know. You know, you've got Sutter, uh, Hamburg, Numeli, uh, Kapeln, Dutzau, Holstein, Hermann, <laughs> Starkenburg, Rhineland, Kiel, Potsdam, which is now Pershing, uh, Frankenstein, Westphalia, Schubert, Freiburg, Klutztown. I mean, <laughs> you know, can't get much more German than you that. You really, really can't. Yeah. And the one who's going to pull this all together to be the missionary to little Germany is a Flemish priest, Father Helias, and we'll talk about him later on. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we better close now. Okay. So we close with a prayer. Yeah. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Okay. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.